He's been compared to Peter Jennings. He was the lead anchor for CNN in Espanol for 16 years. Then he joined Veme, the Spanish network associated with public television. And he does a show called Jorge Gestoso Investiga, Jorge Gestoso Investigates on current issues. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much, Patricia. One of the things that we just watched, one of the topics that you cover, um, is immigration. And the Arizona law, which continues to be a very controversial law, um, you covered very many aspects of this law. What can you tell us about what you learned from this experience? I did learn a lot. I spent four months doing the investigation. I went to Arizona. I live in Washington, so I was interviewing what I think that were the key players on that issue. And I did learn that the, in, regarding immigration, the U.S. is very much polarized. There's a lot of passion in each side. Um, I did learn that uh, politicians are exacerbating the fear and the insecurity, trying to match that what the undocumented Hispanics brings is precisely uh, drugs, crime, uh, negative things. I did have uh, the opportunity to interview the sheriff of the Santa Cruz County in Nogales, uh, Antonio Estrada, he has been in, with the police for 40 years, and it's the only Hispanic in the border. And on camera, he has his statement saying that those things are lies. Hispanics are not bringing crime. The crime has, as a matter of fact, diminished. They are not the source of, the, as, as Janet Brewer, the government, said that they were the drug mules. They are not. There's a, a very less than 0.1% of Hispanics that are bringing drugs. But that has been done with a political purpose. Janet Brewer, when she started with that sort of speech, was having 26% of uh, approval. She started like that. She signed the SB 1070 law and went up to 65% and has been re-elected. And, um, and that, that sort of... Um, strategy, if you want, the idea is if you exacerbate the, the insecurity and the fear, the politician establish him or herself as the person who is going to save you against that and the person that is going to punish with the, with the worst severity that, that type of crimes. And therefore, they appeal to certain parts of the population who like that idea. So there's a lot of politics involved. And also, it has to do with the real sources of the problem of documented immigration, which basically what we discovered was three things. Uh, first of all, the commercial practices of the U.S. with Latin America, what they say that is free trade. The ambassador of Ecuador in Washington that I did interview explained to me that they believe that is not free and not fair because they're using subsidies. For example, with the free trade agreement with Mexico, the NAFTA, the U.S. was putting, 20, during 20 years, $55 billion of subsidies to the U.S. producers, especially with the corn. corn and the NAFTA agreement generates 2.3 million unemployed agricultural workers in Mexico who ended up in the U.S. trying to get a job. The businessmen of the U.S., 450,000 jobs a year are being offered because they don't have uh, enough workers and there's not enough visas for them to come legally. So they know that they're offering jobs to undocumented people. Right. They're totally accomplice. And the third thing is the governments in Latin America who are governing for the rich, and exporting the poor to the U.S. with the endorsement of the U.S. Do you think the, this law hindered or helped or will help get a comprehensive immigration law? What has this law done to the political situation in the United States? I think that it's going to help to get the, um, a, a real immigration reform. Why? Because it's so imperfect. So it has generated so much outrage within the Hispanic community that is pushing the federal government to act. They were doing nothing and basically 
the state of Arizona say, if you don't do it, we'll do it. They did this that is being perceived by the majority of Hispanics as uh, xenophobic, um, any type of negative sides, they say that is uh, uh, discriminatory, etc., etc., and uh, and it's extending to other states. So that is going to push the federal government to act and and take the the bull by the horns and and legislate on that. Because you look at both sides of the issue whenever you do a report, you also spoke to people who said, "This is a problem." Since 1990, we've had five times the number of uh, illegal immigration to Arizona than we ever have. What did you hear from their point of view? Their point of view is that they feel threatened. They believe that these people are coming like vampires to suck everything good that the country offers. Education, health care, bringing the mothers to have the kids in the U.S. They, They are stealing our jobs. And on top of that, they are violating the law. So rather than to be waiting on line their turn, they're jumping the line. And uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot be selective in rewarding people who violate the law. So if you're saying, okay, uh, we work on an immigration reform that basically in the long term regularize their situation, for them it's a fake amnesty. And you cannot grant amnesty to uh, someone who violates the law. That's basically their, their position. In the mainstream media, what about the immigration debate is not being talked about? The four things that you mentioned? Well, the thing is, um, I think the best uh, quote that we have in the, in the special is coming from uh, the congressman from Arizona, Raul Grijalva. He says... This, is a no, this situation of the undocumented workers is not going to be solved by a law in the U.S. This has to be an international effort. The U.S. have to understand that Latin America needs to make uh, progress in terms of health care, employment, um, education. And we are going to depend more and more in our relations with our continent, with Latin America. So, he says, the U.S. has to look itself at the mirror and realizes that you cannot blame on the poor, we cannot blame the the undocumented workers as the core of our problems. He said, we can, it's hypocritical from our side to sell guns to Mexico for them to kill each other, saying in this country we can sell guns and it's a problem. Is, this is part of the hypocrisy of the U.S., he said. It's hypocritical from our side to think that we are the victims. The only victims, he said, in this issue are the poor kids, the migrant kids, that they're being pushed, forced to come to the U.S. in search of a job, because of all those circumstances that the U.S. very much helped to create. So we really have to admit that we are a huge part of the problem. And and, and another uh, another guest, that is uh, Gustavo Torres from Casa de Maryland, that is the largest uh, immigration advocacy uh, institution over there, said the U.S. is not partially responsible of this undocumented problem. It's totally responsible for that because with the the way that it's behaving, that it's acting, it's creating the problem. And he adds, but it's not not only them, also the governments in Africa and in Latin America that export the poor that are also creating the the, the problem. Why? He said, because they're benefiting from the remittances that they're sending to their countries And the only thing that it's doing is recreating a system that is bringing injustice. Right. Let's talk about something else that's happening right now, um, and that is violence. We've seen a lot of violence in Latin America. You've covered violence in in Colombia. But the violence in Mexico right now is is truly worrying, uh, especially the border states. What have you found about that? What's happening there, and what created it, and where do we go from here? Always 
the, the perception is, let's concentrate in this particular frame of the, of the film. Frame of reference, right. It's like if you go to a movie theater, you get in that second in a movie that is already in progress and you see one frame and you're judging... That's it. The, the whole film... No context. That. No context. And the thing is that um, in the US, 5% of the world population consumes about 50% of the cocaine of the world. So if it wouldn't be because of the consumption, nothing could exist from the south border of Mexico down. First thing, the director of the Mexico Institute of the Woodrow Wilson Center in Washington, Andrew Sealy, has said to me, for the U.S. it's much easier to fight a war outside of its borders than inside of the border. So the perception is the U.S. has decided to put all the guilt on the production and all the concentration of the media in picturing that frame. And we're not talking at all about our shared responsibility, which is here there's a huge consumption, probably the largest drug addicts of the world. Second, most of the guns that are being used for that violence are sold from segment from Texas. Third, the um, drug cartels were moving from Colombia to Mexico, right. and they're fighting for territory mostly. And therefore, the thing is, what you are seeing is the U.S. commitment to the drug trafficking problem is helping others to fight there. We're not showing what we are doing to find the problem in ourselves. You mentioned a statistic, which is the United States makes up 5% of the world's population, and consumes 50%, 50 of, the of the cocaine country. of the world. And if you say that to the U.S. authorities, because the idea is always try to defect the responsibility, the say, but you know, there's a new phenomenon in Latin America. Now the Latin Americans are also starting to consume. There's that thing in English that say two wrongs doesn't make one right. Right. The thing is, how many minutes, how many lines in the in, in TV or in radio, how many lines in the newspaper we read every day about the advance or not about the fight against consumption? Very little. Every single night on TV or in the, on, or in the newspapers, you are seeing the awful uh, assassination of tens of people in Mexico. I have no problem at all that everything that happens in Mexico will be reported. Absolutely the, the best thing to do. But what is missing is the other side of the story that we are not seeing reported. Why do you think that is? I think that I, I tend to agree with, uh, with Andrew Sealy because it's much easier to blame someone else and it's much easier to fight a drug war outside of your borders. Right. Let's talk about legalization of drugs. Is there more talk about that in Latin America, in the United States? There's more talk in, in Latin America. Than here? Yeah. Uh, in Mexico, they're talking more and more, and there's big discussion, debate. Even the ex-president, uh, Vicente Fox, uh, was for that, at least was in favor. Uh, and the, 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 they are both sides of the issue. In the U.S., there are some, some, uh, some uh, initiatives in California with the marijuana, you take the profit motive out of it, and that's the main reason, right? They would, they would want to legalize it. You also did Participa in 2008, Participa in 2012. So you're very much in tune with, with Latino power, political power. Tell us what trends you noticed. Well, uh, in 2008, the, the presidential election, there was one, more, one million more of Hispanics who voted, and they're playing more and more a key role to decide certain uh, states and, and even decide the presidency of the, of the U.S. Um, that trend continues. In 2010, in the midterm election, and now in the past November the 4th, there were like 800,000 more Hispanics voted than four years ago, in 2006. The trend is Hispanics were revolted about what they heard about the immigration and the 
the the naming or the bag names that they were getting from 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 part of the of the political spectrum and uh, a new phenomenon that in the midterm election there were some elected officials that were elected and there were Hispanic Republicans because traditionally the Hispanics vote for Democrats about two to one against Republicans. And in this case, for example, in the case of uh, Miami and the, the Florida with this gentleman Rubio, he was a Republican of the Tea Party that was getting part of his electorate was the Hispanic vote. How, how do you think that, that that's changing, though? We, we see Hispanics voting more, but you, we hear this sleeping giant will wake up. Will Hispanics really have that much political power when they don't register to vote? You said they increased one million in the last election. How much more do they need to increase to really have power? A lot. It could be 20 million voters. There are 20 million Hispanics that are uh, able to vote and only um, 9 million are registered. So there's a long way ahead. This, and also one of the things that happened with the Hispanic community, according to the sources, is that this is not a monolithic community. There's little, it's a mosaic of different groups who do not act as a whole. So you have the Mexicans American being two out of three Hispanics, the Cubans in Miami, the Puerto Ricans in New York, the Dominicans, Central Americans, South Americans, but there's no one leader, there's no one movement. Why do you notice, though, so much voter apathy within the, the Latin community? If you have 11 million when there could be 20 million voting, why aren't they? I will say that two things. Education. And on top of that, uh, that uh, sentiment or feeling of deception, of deceiving, that uh, this, is, this is a political system that is so unfair to me that uh, I'm not going to change anything. And that sort of comes from, from Latin America, their experience of Latin America, right, where the, where the governments don't respond to the people. Um, let me ask you about Latin America and the United States and the relationship. Brazil is now a very powerful economy. Um, some Latin American countries are, are actually growing dramatically economically. Will this change the relationship between the United States and Latin America? which has generally seen Latin America as sort of the little brother. The perception is that it's not going to change. The perception is that the U.S. still has uh, pretty low in, in his list of priorities Latin America. It's much more concerned about the Middle East, Egypt, Israel, uh, North Korea, um, everything that could be nuclear, Afghanistan, Iran, Pakistan. And that, that concentrates their agenda. Latin America compared to those regions are pretty much stable. The economic relations is that the U.S. really cares, works pretty well. There's no interruption of flowing of any raw material that the U.S. really need. Um, but what is taking place is Latin America is growing because there's a new phenomenon in Latin America that is China. China has come to Latin America and is buying left and right. right. Brazil is selling them not only their crops, but uh, they're, they're building uh, shipyards. Technology. Technology. They're selling exactly. Chinese technology. Planes. Right. Um, Chile, it has uh, copper. Argentina with its soybean, etc., etc. So... Latin America, in terms of the economy, first of all, it weathered the, the world financial crisis much better than the U.S. Right. And second, has been growing steadily. It's doing well. It's doing better. There's optimism in Latin America. And they, the region has learned that they could live without depending so much as they did historically with the U.S. So Latin America is, is starting to wear uh, the long trousers. Right, right, right. And, uh, and the U.S. More is, sure of themselves. Exactly. And the U.S. is keeping a good relationship, but it's not necessarily investing in the, f in the future of that partnership. So you don't see that changing very much in the next 10? Uh, at least it's what I hear in Washington from, from the experts. 
Let's talk about Latinos in the United States. What, what do you find as a journalist are some of the greatest challenges they face to really thrive in this country? There is, there is a lot of a stigma. Uh, in a way, um, could be discussed, but the, the, the story of the American dream, it's a subject of, uh, of a big uh, question. Uh, because what is the American dream compared to what? Um, and someone was mentioning here here in, in, in Houston, there is this gentleman who came from Mexico. He started as a dishwasher in a restaurant. Now he owns seven. Blah, blah, blah. So, so that is American dream. But we're not talking about that he's in the engineer of NASA that is going to put the next uh, people in Mars. So even though you can have some Hispanics that could be thriving, is thriving by report or where did they start? So I don't see Hispanics being the key players in this country. They are not really in key positions of corporations or government of uh, different aspects of social society. They are achieving success by comparison to where they were coming from. So it's not an absolute success. It's a relative success. And, and that is, I think, the stigma. If you were coming from a Hispanic origin, you are going to reach up to here. And you are not going to be further because the circumstances, the many, are not going to let you go. Why did you come to the United States from Uruguay? Uh, a love story. It is a love story. <laughs> it's a love I story. like love stories. <laughs> well, you know, that, 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 that's, that's what people are going to get from this. We from, want to know. From, yeah. <laughs> the thing is, I, I did meet in Uruguay my, my, my current wife. She's uh, from Europe. And we decided to live halfway from her place and our place in a neutral territory. So neither of us could be a total local and then one a total visitor. And she knew English and I knew Spanglish. <laughs> and, uh, and that's why we, uh, we ended up here. How has Hispanic media changed since you started? Uh, it grew in terms of it became more um, elaborated. Um, technically it could be most sophisticated. My concern is that there is room for improvement in terms of catering uh, segments of the Hispanic population that watch Hispanic commercial television that could be, for, in my opinion, lacking more quality or more in-depth programming. That, that's 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 the that's the subject that is still pending, uh, but but it has grown incredibly even in the viewership. In, there are sometimes in Miami that the the most watched news program is in Spanish. Right. Well, and in some markets like Los Angeles, they watch more Spanish. Exactly. What of all the interviews you've done in your lifetime, you've interviewed presidents, mm -hmm. celebrities. Which one had the most impact on you personally? In general, <clears throat> the, the interviews that I like the most are from, uh, from the, the, the common person on the street. Because a common person on the street tells it as it is. The politicians, in most of the cases, are spin doctors. They use you to, send, to set their agenda. They are not going to answer the question that you put them against the ropes because they, that's the, what, what the people want to know. And, um, and you, another thing is the most interesting things are done by people that are not famous. So sometimes you say, well, tonight I'm going to watch the interview with so-and-so because it's so-and-so. But Joe Sixpack <laughs> could be more interesting as a, as a contributor of society than a, a renowned Person. Thank you so much, Jorge Gestoso, for being with us. We really appreciate it. Thank you to you, Patricia, for inviting me.